So thanks for joining me here. The main thrust of what we're going to talk about today is a new segment we're trying. Um, it's called A Week on the Wrist Revisited. Uh, mm. And I wanted to kick it off by talking about one of your all-time great reviews, one of my all-time favorite reviews we've ever done, uh, which is your review of the Tudor Black Bay GMT. Mm -hmm. uh, super popular review. People loved it. Tons of comments. Uh, one of the highest trafficked reviews we've, we've ever done. We'll have some categories that we'll go through to really break things down bit by bit, but to, to start things off, can you just kind of remind people what the deal is with this watch? Like, what is the watch? What's kind of the context to uh, to this watch's release? Sure. So the reason we wanted to do a, um, a week on the wrist with uh, with a watch like the Black Bay GMT is because arguably for 2018, it came out in Baselworld 2018. I mean, I think our first post about it was March 21st to put a timestamp on it. But the the big thing here is this is this is like Tudor's year for Baselworld. They, yeah. they put out a GMT watch that instantly everyone wanted. And then like three minutes later, they put out a 39 millimeter Black Bay that still everybody really wants. These are like two which, of the hottest you've got. You've got which one I on am wearing currently. right now. Yeah. Rad. And uh, I would say like definitely in in that space. And this is a space where like Rolex had a really good 2018 as well. But I think that they like there was some milkshake being drank between the family there and and and. I think a lot of that came down to these two watches and, and that's not like a, there's no take there that it came down to these two watches. There's not really another way to, to look yeah. at it. But in, in this case, you're looking at a, um, uh, a steel 41 millimeter, um, you know, 200 meter water resistant, uh, sports watch based on the entire black Bay GMT family. We already know, uh, the BB 41s and, and in this case, it's, it now has a 24 hour bezel. And most notably, and, and the thing that really kind of blew a lot of people out of the water who understand the whole sphere of GMT watches is Tudor went ahead and made their own movement. And then with that movement, they offered uh, local jumping hours, which is the feature set you would find on something like a GMT Master 2, which is a watch that would cost more than double if you were even able to, say, walk into a store and buy one. Yeah. Uh, 15 millimeters thick, it's about 50 millimeters lug to lug. So I would say in the, in the span... In that sweet window of, of watches that, that kind of the Hodinkee overall audience, the sizing metric that everyone uses, it's just slightly on the on the larger size, but it's not that big yeah. a watch. Uh, 41's very wearable. Uh, 15's pretty much normal for a dive watch, especially one with 200 meters water resistance and, and a big crystal and all that kind of stuff. And then 50 millimeters lug to lug is going to be good for just about anyone's wrist. And like I said, the, the big point here wasn't so much that they made another great dive watch that had been going on for four or five years before that with the Black Bays, but the uh, it's the introduction of the MT5652 uh, that really meant that the watch had no comp competition. There's no peers yeah. to this watch. There aren't other local jumping hour uh, GMTs. I can sit here and start listing ones that have existed previously at this price point. Omega used to make some. Uh, but now Omega's GMTs are more money. They're even thicker. They're typically larger, and um, and and they're they're you know Omega's aesthetic has moved away from simply the tulish and into more polished surfaces and that sort of thing. And and with the mm. with the BB GMT, what you really get is a black bay, something that people already really know and like a blue and red bezel that's in kind of a muted Tudor esque sort of colorway, and then a simple matte dial and a, a very useful travel complication. And a watch Great. that you don't have to take off in the pool. You wouldn't have to take off if you were diving. Like, you just wear it. So, like a, a born one watch, for sure. Before we get into the categories, can you can you give us the TLDR version of, of the week on the wrist review? Like, for somebody who hasn't seen it, first of all, you should go watch it. Like, pause this and go watch the review. It's a couple minutes long. Uh, the video is. You can do the deep reading later. But, uh, yeah, what what's the TLDR version of this review for people? All right, if we're going to step into the review, I, I do need to do a bit of a costume change for you because this is a video medium. So just give me one moment. <laughs> oh, there we go. For people listening and not watching this, James has just changed into the clothing he was wearing when he did the review. So um, this is something that, that like annually is probably one of the most... Th this piece of work, this this post that a lot of people put a lot of time into, and it's my face and my name on. But the uh, the one thing that I will consistently get is from people who write another like, I really like that GMT review. Um, I, I love that watch now. Or some people say I even bought the watch, and they don't have a question about the watch. They don't really have a question about the review. 
they just want to know where I got my green jacket. Uh, it, it's a very common DM that I still get, and uh, and and maybe this will slow slow some of you down. But it's from the Gap. I think I paid thirty five bucks for it on a rack. Great. Uh, it's not it. fancy, you know. It, it's uh, I don't baby it. it. It it is one of my more favorite things to wear. I pop up in all sorts of uh, little bits of content and photos, and certainly you see the green in lots of wrist shots. But it's a uh, it's a recurring theme in my Instagram DMs. There we go. Uh, since that came up, but uh, the TLDR for the review is simple. We wanted to um, we wanted to take a travel watch and actually do some traveling. Um, it's not ironic, but uh, whatever the word would be, uh, we didn't actually change time zones. We were heading north south. It's true. Uh, but we were already planning on being on the west coast to do a series of podcast recordings the very early days of Hodinkee Radio. Yeah. And uh, and along with that, we knew we had. Uh, Gray, who's actually on this call uh, uh, quietly and, and invisibly, um, and, and as our producer, and, and so we decided to take what was going to be maybe a, a calm, peaceful sort of tour of San Francisco and LA, and make it a few really terrible days of work for everyone. Um, <laughs> and by terrible, I mean it was really only hard on Gray. Uh, I, I basically just hung out in front of a camera and talked about a watch that I really like. And uh, yeah, that that was basically the the premise. Is we, we you know we went from. Uh, San Francisco down to LA. We we shot mostly in San Francisco, and the idea there was simply to suggest that this is a sort of watch that kind of slots itself into the sort of person that likes to move around. And whether yeah. you're doing some tourism or or just some general appreciation, even of your own city, the idea was more about you know movement and uh, and flexibility, which is you know what this watch does so well. Let's get into the categories. So first up, we're gonna do elevator pitch. You've got thirty seconds to kind of explain this watch and kind of pitch it to people. So 30 seconds on the clock, go. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a Tudor sport watch that has the same movement functionality as a $10,000 Rolex sport watch. It wears the same way, it offers a ton of water resistance. There's not, like it kind of, it sells itself. You either want a GMT or you don't, and if you do, this one had better be on your list. Great, you managed to pull that off in like 20 seconds, so I think you get some, you get some bonus points there. Well, I'll use it up later in the chat, I'm sure. <laughs> What's uh, next category is uh, first thing. So we talked a little bit about, you know, your first experiences with this, your initial reactions. But for somebody picking this watch up for the first time, what is the first thing they're going to notice about this watch? Yeah, I think it's most noticeable overall feature is the bezel color. Uh, yeah. Because it, and, and it's not so much that the color is or isn't good. I, I honestly think it doesn't matter. I think the coloring on the bezel is very good. Um, but it's the fact that they went blue red, which connects to the history of the GMT Master. Which, while there is, yeah. of course, this very close connection between Rolex and Tudor being essentially sibling companies, um, that's not necessarily Tudor's history. Uh, that's that's Rolex's history. But they were making a direct connection, and I think if they had done that and then put um, a normal 24-hour GMT hand movement and add a 28932 or their version of of that sort of functionality. It would have seemed so half baked, but to have done uh, the blue red bezel, which is kind of like that's like going up and picking up the big weights off the rack, putting a blue red bezel on your on your GMT watch, and then also having the ability to like sit back and actually throw a rep down with that movement. I, I think that's how it works out. All right, up next we've got uh, the best design choice. Uh, what's what's the thing that Tudor did here? that it could have easily gone south and instead they made a really smart conscious choice. Yeah, I think I think for me it's funny because the watch is in many ways fairly minimal. I mean, obviously you have a bezel which some people will use and other people won't depending on if they understand how, how it's used, how it's best used. Um, but I think it's the long GMT hand. If you look at it, it, it goes right to the edge of the dial. And I mm. think you, you, there's tons of GMT watches where it's a, this little like half measure hand which makes yeah. it feel a little bit more balanced or in a photo looks great. And then when you actually go to use it and you're talking about reading 24 hour time from it, it's a huge pain. Um, and, and then in this case, instead of doing a small hand in an internal scale, a 24 hour scale that sits inside, they really just went with like, oh, how can we communicate the most information with the least amount of stuff on the dial? And the end result mm -hmm. is you get this big, long, red, uh, GMT hand with a nice luminous, you know, diamond at the end. And then what that does is, is not only does that communicate a lot and it's super legible, but it leaves the rest of the dial to be very minimal. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you've seen um, a lot of modern watches now, certainly other watches from within the Rolex and Tudor lineup, there's a lot of text happening on the dial. 
And I yeah. think that they they went a really nice direction by just saying like, nope, this is a, a GMT watch and you will understand that because the bezel is blue and red and it has a fourth hand that's bright red. And, and they said the rest could just be like basic. The watch photographs beautifully because there's very little going on in the dial. The dial's not reflective. The date display is very unobtrusive. I, th I think that the overall design is, is uh, for me, what, what would stand out. But the, the starting point, I think what you, your first hit would be the, the GMT hand. Nice. All right. So we've talked about what's good. What's something you'd change here? It doesn't have to be something you think is bad, but what, what is the thing that you would want to change if you could redesign this watch? I'd put the entire thing in a BB58 case, make it 39 millimeters, and I would go with a colorless bezel. And I mean that specifically in like an engraved steel bezel. You love an engraved steel bezel. Yeah, it's just like it's the, it, it's, there's no color. Le leave some color on the GMT hand so I can see it. But otherwise, like uh, the blue red is fine. I'd go full red, maybe bring back burgundy, like call on something else from Tudor. But I love the BB steel. I think that's okay. such a cool look, and I think that would translate so well to uh, to a watch like this. And then it, the other thing that's nice about these is there's something about GMT watches where I think they, they are legitimately meant to never come off your wrist, mm -hmm. which means they're going to get covered in scratches. And a steel bezel, like with a nice thick steel insert that's engraved, will take those scratches so well uh, without having to worry about anything flaking off or, or damaging a numeral. So you can't read it anymore or something like, like in 20 years, a watch like that look incredible. Okay. I, I, uh, I, I'd, I'd, I'd take a look at that watch. Let's put it that way. Yeah. I think it could be cool. It's a little yeah. Photoshop project. Yeah. All right. Cool. Um, all right. The next category we're calling it branded. Um, if you were to challenge another brand to make their version of this watch, who would you want to see give it a stab? I mean, the first one that comes to mind is Doxa because I adore the GMT watch that used to make. And if that watch was made, so that was the 750T GMT, specifically the Caribbean, which is a blue orange colorway. Um, they also had one of my favorite GMT hands, which was the, if you take the outer dimension of the hour hand and then skeletonize it. So it doesn't matter oh, how the hands cool. overlap, you can always see it. That's uh, cool. I, I absolutely adore that watch. They are discontinued, very hard to find. You you can't imagine a watch at forty two and a half millimeters that wears this small, like any Doxas. They just disappear when they're actually on your wrist. So I'd love to see that functionality come to another sort of like travel dive watch, whether it was a Doxa, or I mean, man, I, I wouldn't it be sweet to see something with this functionality come out from like Longines? Yeah, like a be really amazing. slick forty millimeter steel dive watch, kind of no nonsense, and then boom, this like killer movement. And you'd think with yeah. the, like the way the whole Swatch network goes together, they just the right people would have to kind of be in line to kind of make that Connect Four, yeah. and then yeah. you'd, you'd have that movement. They could make anything in the world. Be, be pretty exciting. awesome. But I think like yeah, yeah like a Longines, a Doxa, like if like if if Tudor's gonna literally own an entire marketplace at say forty five hundred dollars for this, I'd love to see someone come in at two thousand twenty five hundred bucks, something like okay. that. Cool. So more than the cost of where we see the Eta twenty eight ninety three stuff, which is say a thousand to two thousand bucks, but lesser yeah. than four. Cool. Uh, we're we're gonna call this one uh, Fantasy Island here. Uh, somebody hands you this watch, and I'm this is probably anachronistic, but and a blank check, sure, mm -hmm. uh, and says, do do with this what you will. Like what's what's the perfect scenario for this watch? If you could take it anywhere, do anything with it, where where are you taking this watch? Yeah, I, I think you're you're loading up a plane with a little bit of dive gear, crossing a few time zones to head to the Caribbean, and uh, landing on some like dirt track and then diving off of some island where nobody's going to be around. There's nobody else in the water. Uh, I think I think like a remote kind of like flying and diving scenario would be w where the sweet spot would be for this watch. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you you've touched on it a couple times, but I think that really like narrows in on it. Which is that one of the things that makes this watch so interesting is it's it's a travel watch, but it's also a dive watch. Like it really, mm -hmm. it is good at both instead of sort of like being a halfway point between the two. It is both a great dive watch and a great GMT watch. Yep. And I mean, in, in a lot of these cases, when a company, they go and they make it the travel watch, they drop the water resistance to 100 meters in some reason, in some ways for no reason sometimes. But with this, it's so Tudor to just be like, we can do it. So we're going to do it. The other ones are the one we're basing yeah. it on is 200 meters. So you get 200 meters and sure it doesn't yeah. have the bezel. I wouldn't call it like a proper tool dive watch. You can't, you can definitely still track elapsed time. You're just going to have to do a little bit of five minute math in your, in your head. 
Yeah. Um, but as as a backup to a dive computer, this is a totally appropriate thing, and and it's gonna be it's gonna be awesome again, like coming out on dive gear covered in sand and that kind of thing. Like it's perfect. Sweet. Look at right at home in a small plane full of dive gear, heating, you know, taking photos out of the windows. I'm fl- I'm assuming I'm flying. I don't know. I don't. I'm You're not flying the plane. All right. <laughs> yeah. All right, why not? <laughs> uh, all right. Last last one for you here. This is the uh, this is the lifer question. Could this be your one watch for life? I think easily. Yeah, yeah. Like if yeah. I didn't already own a couple really nice dive watches and a couple really great GMT watches, this would have been an instant buy for me. I don't have yeah. room for it in my collection. I don't like to own too, that many watches. And if I ever find myself, you know, without an Explorer 2 or without a Doxer or whatever, to it is that kind of like, it is that kind of like, it, it's not, a, you know, because Tudor doesn't really do quirky typically. They do like very, not so much stoic. I mean, the Palagos is quite stoic, but they do very like refined objects. Yeah, and uh, and with with something like this, you get that kind of overlap of that what makes Rolex great and that what makes dive watches just the general world of dive watches great is all kind of comes into one place as it does throughout all of the Black Bays. It's one nice. of the things that makes them such great watches. Yeah, totally agree. Um, cool. Well, this this has been fun. We're going to continue to do stuff like this. We'll probably refine the the process and the categories a bit as we do it but uh this felt like the right way to kick it off this this to me is an all-time week on the wrist uh we'll link it up in the show notes if you haven't watched the video go watch it if you have watched it go watch it again it's great i don't think i've watched any week on the wrist more than this one um i got to be involved in the shoot which was very very nice very fun um did a little behind the scenes stuff but uh this is just like this is awesome it, it does the the video does a great job of showing how a watch can be a great companion uh this watch in particular but great watches in general like if if you want to understand if you don't understand already which if you don't i don't know why you'd be listening to this but (laughs) if uh if you don't understand why watches can be like romantic and exciting like this this review does a great job explaining it yeah i think it's a nice um, a modern tool watch that's ready for kind of whatever you want to throw at it it looks great you know i can only imagine a couple scenarios where it wouldn't seem quite right black tie or something like that and at which point yeah. you know just drop drop it in your jacket pocket for for the for the dinner you got people to talk to anyways yeah um, but otherwise i think i think like this is a like what it's absolutely one of my favorite modern sport watches without exception awesome cool well thanks for doing this man really appreciate it and uh my pleasure I'll see you on a, another zoom call i'm sure very soon oh minutes i'm sure yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right see you man awesome later dude